Ever stumbled upon an old classic movie that sent chills down your spine? Imagine a story where a young couple moves into an eerie apartment building in New York City. Strange occurrences unfold, especially when the woman finds out she's pregnant. One of the standout characters is the nosy neighbor, played by a seasoned Hollywood actress. As you dive into the story, you might wonder about the hidden tales behind the scenes. Any memories or anecdotes pop up? Share your thoughts below. Get ready for a suspenseful journey filled with mystery and intrigue. Keep exploring for more fascinating tidbits about this unforgettable film and feel free to share your own experiences too. In 1968, the movie Rosemary's Baby hit the big screen, sending chills down the spines of audiences everywhere. It was a time when horror movies were just starting to take on new forms, and this film quickly became a classic of the genre. Directed by Roman Polanski, the movie follows the story of Rosemary Woodhouse, a young woman who moves into a new apartment with her husband, Guy. Little did she know, their new neighbors had sinister plans for her and her unborn child. This film was significant because it pushed the boundaries of horror, delving into themes of paranoia, manipulation, and the oculotenant it captured the fears of its era, reflecting the anxieties of a changing society. Rosemary's Baby became a cultural phenomenon, leaving a lasting impact on the horror genre and solidifying its place in cinematic history. It remains a must-watch for horror enthusiasts and continues to terrify audiences to this day. In a lesser-known twist, one of the L, a sets was repurposed for a sequence in the Monkees movie head. Interestingly, Oscar-nominated editor Sam Osteen later directed the sequel, Look What's Happened to Rosemary's Baby. Notably, the film features Jamie Simone Gomez, who would later become a cult leader known by various names. In the world of movies, there are stories that stick with us long after the credits roll. One such tale involves a group of determined people who came together to create something special. It all started with a clever move by Robert Evans, who convinced a talented director, Roman Polanski, to come on board for a film project. Despite some doubts at first, Polanski and others, like Ruth Gordon, who hadn't been in movies for a long time, jumped at the chance to be part of it. Their dedication paid off when Gordon won an Oscar for her role in the movie. This story shows us that with hard work and persistence, even the toughest challenges can be overcome in the world of movie making. In June of 66, the baby is due, also known as 666. Throughout the movie, notable scenes are set at the south entrance of the Dakota Apartments, where John Lennon was tragically shot in 1980. Dr. Abe, whose surname is coincidentally close to the founder of the Harlem Globetrotters, Abe Saperstein, plays a significant role in the film. Interestingly, the real-life Abe Saperstein passed away in 1966, the same year as much of the movie's events. In the realm of horror cinema, there's a standout classic from 1968 that took a unique path. Unlike some of its peers like The Exorcist and The Omen, Rosemary's Baby didn't become a franchise. While those films led to multiple sequels and reboots, the movie only had a TV movie sequel that quickly faded away due to poor ratings and reviews, putting an end to any hopes of expanding the story further. There's a persistent myth that Alfred Hitchcock directed Rosemary's Baby, but that's not true. Despite rumors, Hitchcock was never offered the chance to helm the project. In an interesting detail, one of the characters in the movie places a book about witches atop two volumes of the famous Kinsey Report on Human Sexuality. It's a subtle blend of the supernatural with insights into human behavior. Unlike its horror counterparts, the movie stands alone as a classic without branching into a franchise. Its influence remains confined to a single installment, distinguishing it from the fate of its contemporaries. This movie delves into a storyline centered around rape. Interestingly, the son of one of its stars would later expose the prevalent issue of rape culture in America through investigative journalism. Elisha Cook Jr., known for his roles in several significant films, including this one, added depth to the cast. On a particular episode in 1980, writer Era Levin, alongside Stephen King, revealed his childhood fears, reflecting the eerie themes of the movie. Despite its release in 1968, the movie's themes and impact remain relevant today. The final film of Mona Knox was notable for its adaptation of the source material. In a pivotal scene, the protagonist, while in a cab, reads from the Book of Ceremonial Magic by A.E. Wait, specifically delving into chapter 4 the rituals of black magic section for the grimoire of Honorius. This excerpt adds depth to the narrative's occult themes. One significant deviation between the novel and the movie is a crucial phone call. In the novel, Rosemary's older sister, Margaret, contacts her out of concern for her well-being. Despite their limited communication, Margaret urges Rosemary to remain indoors, sensing impending danger. 
Rosemary agrees, but the ominous atmosphere persists as she continues her evening with Guy. Elia Kazan, residing near the street where key scenes unfolded, observed Roman Polanski's directorial process. Nearby, Boris Karloff had an apartment in the same locale. Meanwhile, Lauren Buckhall owned a residence where William Castle, the producer, occasionally visited. Ruth Gordon's portrayal of Mistress Castivet mirrored her character in Harold, and Maud three years later, Sam's the sinister undertones. In the narrative, Tanny's root played a pivotal role, yet it's a fictional creation by Errol Levin, akin to the letters of transit in Casablanca. This blend of behind-the-scenes anecdotes and fictional elements creates a distinctive atmosphere in the film, adding layers to the narrative and engaging the audience in an intriguing tale. In Dr. Saperstein's office, Rosemary receives compliments on her perfume de Chema, created by Ravel and Frears in 1953. The scent boasts floral and woody notes, including lime blossom, narrowly, bergamot, peach, rose, jasmine, illing illing, hyacinth, lily of the valley, carnation, orris, sandalwood, tonka, musk, and vetiver. In a scene, Rosemary reads Yes, I Can, Sammy Davis Jr.'s autobiography, which adds depth to the movie's themes. Davis, a member of the Church of Satan during the late 60s and early 70s, found a lure in its hedonistic ideals. His association and subsequent disillusionment mirror the film's exploration of cult seduction and victimization. Notably, Morris Evans from Bewitched and Emmeline Henry from I Dream of Jeannie joined the cast. Both TV shows involve protagonists dabbling in witchcraft and magic, offering intriguing connections to Rosemary's Baby. Part of the Criterion Collection, Spine 630, this film faced challenges in casting. Initially, Roman Polanski envisioned an all-American girl for the lead role, considering Tuesday Weld, and then Jane Fonda, who declined. Sharon Tate was contemplated, but deemed unethical. Mia Farrow, then Mistress Frank Sinatra, was eventually chosen, recommended by Robert Evans. For the role of Guy Woodhouse, Robert Redford was sought, but negotiations faltered. John Cassavetes eventually took the part. Mia Farrow lent her vocals to the title sequence lullaby, adding a personal touch to the film's ambience. The casting process was complex, involving various considerations and negotiations shaping the final ensemble cast, which brought the narrative to life. In the 1968 movie, the color yellow is really important. It shows up a lot when we see Rosemary, her husband Guy, and their apartment. Yellow can mean different things like happiness and clarity, but also cowardice and deceit. Something interesting about the movie is that it's the last time we see Jane Crawley in a film. The movie also sneaks in ads for stuff. Like Yamaha scooters are in there a bunch, and they talk about Paul Mall cigarettes, Scrabble, Lipton Tea, and Time Life Publishing Company. They even show the cover of a Time magazine from April 8, 1966, where they ask, Is God dead? All these little details are part of what makes the movie special. The colors they use and the ads they slip in help tell the story and show what life was like back then.